trust in God. Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you again today. I hope you've been, um, I hope you're ready to go through the book of Colossians, because that's what we're going to be studying. We're, so there's only four chapters, but I mean it's jam-packed with meat. And I think I said this the other day, but um, I heard somebody say one time that Peter was the milkman, but Paul was the meat man. So he had a lot of meat to give us. And I'm telling you, Colossians is sure, sure, surely a meaty little letter. Uh, so we hope to go through it verse by verse, savoring every little bit so that it will uh, build us all up and what we already have in Christ. That's all we can ever do for each other is build each other up in what we already have in Christ. Exhort and build up and um, in what Christ has already given us, but how easily we are pulled off into anything other than Christ in Christ alone. And, um, you know, we're saved by Christ alone. We're not saved by good works. We're not saved by church uh, membership or baptism or, or, or any good works of our own. We're simply saved by Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and the fact that receive Him as Lord and Savior will cleanse you from all your sins. If you have not done that, you see, maybe you need to bow your knee right now and, and know that Jesus loves you. If, <laughs> I've always heard this. If you were the only person in the whole world that he would have to come to die for, he would come just for you. He loves you that much. You know, you are created in God's image. Now, we're fallen and we're lost before we have Christ. Before we've been found, we are lost. However, and we're fallen, but we're originally made in God's image. So we're just fallen from our Creator. And so the whole point of salvation is that you can be unified again to your Creator. And that's God Almighty. Can you imagine, can you even think of that? That God wants you to be His child? That it doesn't matter what you've done, what you haven't done, what you think you should have done, or what you could have done. It, has, it matters not. What matters is, do you have a heart that really wants Jesus? It's not, just, it's not a mind thing. It's not something that you can just know in your mind and uh, just like you know about history or know about what's going on in, in the news. But this is, this is a person. This is Jesus, the person of Jesus himself that you can receive and know. He will come inside of you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness and make you holy and make you righteous and God declares you righteous. Why? Because Jesus has already done the work. It's not because of your righteousness. None of us stand because of our own righteousness. None of us um, will meet God and brag about any righteous thing that any of us have done. If we do, he'll say, I never knew you. Because it's never going to be from anything that I'm righteous of. It's the very fact that I'm living, I'm deriving my righteousness from the righteous one who lives within me, who is Christ himself. Now that's the gospel. And if you don't know Jesus, bow right now and pray this prayer with me. Close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I want you with all my heart. Come inside me. Cleanse me from all my sin. I know that the cro your cross has completed the work. I don't have to do one thing to earn, your, earn salvation. Just receive you into my heart. Please come into my heart. Join yourself with me. Cause me to know you. Cause me to know that I'm forgiven. And thank you that I am forgiven of all my sins, that you've done the work, Lord. Thank you. And just by that simple prayer, it says, it says, if we confess with our mouth that God has raised Jesus from the dead and believe in our heart, you shall be saved. So it's a heart. 
It's something that happens in your heart. And you know if you are or not. If you are, you have just received the fullness of the Godhead bodily inside of you. Wow. I mean, we don't have to wait years and years and years to discover our completeness in Christ. We don't have to. I mean, the gospel is that Christ has now come in you. And that's what really the book of Colossians is about. Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Okay, his blood washes you from all your sins. The blood of Jesus that he set, that he that was poured out for your sins washes you clean. And the body, through his body, he is he has given you a new nature, a new life, a new life within you. The old life is past, the new life has come in you, and that new life is Jesus himself. Wow. Wow, I mean, it's so big. I mean, it still just gives me cold chills every time I hear, I watch the classic Billy Graham, you know, on t TV some. And I'm telling you, every time they sing Just As I Am, my kids used to watch me. And every time they would get to that song, the tears would be flowing. And it still touches me. Okay, now we're going to be talking about Colossians. Now, why Colossians in the first place? Why was this letter written? I want you to know that most of the letters written by Paul was basically because there was a problem. These were early churches. These were young believers. And there's always something that comes up that diverts them away from the simplicity that was in Christ and the fact that we've received a person. We haven't even received a thing called eternal life. Eternal life is a person. It's Christ himself. We haven't received a thing called salvation. We've received a person. You see, so it's so easy to get diverted off of that, 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 that simple truth, which is foundational to Christianity. And really, Paul is a, certainly a foundational uh, builder. He loves to build foundations because if our foundation is not right, the whole house will be wrong. You know yourself if, uh, if you've seen somebody build a house or maybe you've um, experienced it some yourself. If you're a builder, um, if it's not level in the very beginning, if it's not balanced and level in the very beginning, the whole house will be off. Well, you see, uh, our whole foundation has to be built on the person of Christ and not on um, even religious thinking about Christ. Or, 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 or. It's not built on a thing, it's built on a person the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, even when we ask for, like when I ask for peace, Lord, give me more peace. He's not going to give you more peace. He's not going to give the vessel. We are a human vessel. The Bible calls us a vessel. He's not going to give the vessel more peace. But He is the peace that passes all understanding. He is the Prince of Peace that lives within you. So you don't have to ask Him to give you more peace. What you need to say is, thank you, Lord. I don't feel it. I don't feel very peaceful right now. But I know you live inside me, and you're the Prince of Peace, and I'm trusting that. That's all it takes. And sometimes we might say, gosh, you know, if I could just love somebody more, I just feel like I don't like this person, and I don't like that person. Well, there's a lot of people I don't like either. But I know the difference between like and love. A lot of people don't know the difference between like and love. So... Uh, like means I may or may not like you today. Tomorrow I might like you. But love is eternal. Li love is, uh, like is like the weather. <laughs> and love is forever. Oh, that's a good catchy thing. L like is like the weather. It comes and goes. Love is forever. Because love is the person of Christ himself. It says in 1 John that God is love. So he doesn't have it to give. That's who he is. And that's who he will be in you because he has, he has created you so that he can express his love through. And so even when I don't like so-and-so, I can always say, well, but I know you're in me and you are love. So I thank you that you'll love them through me, even though I don't feel like it right now. That's okay. And you don't try to force love. You don't try to force any of these things. You give it to the Lord. You constantly give it to the Lord and see he is love. So, like is like the weather, it comes and goes, but love is forever. Once you have Jesus, who is your love, that's forever. And that's forever within us. And that's the whole 
point of Colossians, Christ in you, the only hope of glory. So now let's go and see where Colossae is. Colossae is a city. Now, Paul had never been to that city. It's in Turkey. It's what we call Turkey today. It wasn't very far from Ephesus. Um, it was like 100 miles east of Ephesus. And, uh, you know, Paul, when he went to Ephesus, he taught there three years in a school. He taught a school where he taught all uh, the whole counsel of God in that school for two or three years. I think it was three years. It could have been two, you see. Well, he was there teaching. Well, it, well, there were people from Colossae that came over to Ephesus 100 miles and walking 100 miles. That would be a long walk. But if you're desperate and you want to know the truth, you want to know the fullness of the gospel, and you have to remember, these were pagan people. These were Gentiles. These, these were, there were few Jews in these cities. They didn't have any Jewish roots. They just had pagan roots. And they had God, God and goddesses that they worshipped. And, and they, they had worshipped and their ancestors had worshipped these god and goddesses, which really were principalities and powers. I want you to know they're wicked, wicked principalities and powers that ruled over the areas. But they had, they, they had ruled over those areas for 4,000 years. And here Paul shows up and he is confronting these principalities and powers that's been there for 4,000 years. Can you imagine? No wonder they tried to kill him. No wonder they hated him. But you see, God, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he fought with wild beasts before he even went to, to Ephesians, to Ephesus meaning that he probably did warfare with, against principalities and powers so that he could, it could, he could have the clearing so that he could go there. As soon as he went there, I mean, they worshiped the goddess Diana. They made little uh, statues of her, and they worshiped her, and the, and the silversmiths and the coppersmiths who made these little statues, uh, Paul was going to put them out of business. I mean, the uh, commerce and the business and... Uh, and uh, you see, he was he was not only spoiling the principal the power and the principalities over that area. He was taking away their money. Oh, you take away their money, and people will want to kill you even today. Okay, so but the apostle Paul it took the apostolic power of a great apostle to move into that area with the other. Uh, apostles and disciples that he had with him. And they, they were there for two years. And it's, it's only because, you know, God opened that space for them to be there because those principalities and powers ruled that area. So probably uh, a man came from Colossae, maybe several, maybe there were a group of people that came from Colossae because they wanted to know the gospel. They wanted to know the God of Paul, the God that would really set a heart free, that would not put you into bondage where you were a slave to these principalities and powers where they ruled over you and enslaved you and with wickedness, really. And your heart was enslaved with the devil, really. You were bound up with the devil. And so they wanted to be free. They wanted to know the true God. They wanted to know Paul's God. And so they probably came from Colossae into Ephesus. And there was a man, a certain man, named Epaphras. And I, maybe I'm pronouncing that name right. I hope I am. He's the one that really became one of the main leaders there in Colossae that was really probably totally schooled in what Paul taught. Well, he took that back to Colossians. Paul personally had never been to Colossians. Well, this had been some time after Paul had been in Ephesians and he had, he had done all three of his journeys. He ended up in Rome in prison. Now, that's the last part of Paul's life. So what's happening is during those years, the church has lost their foundation. And, you know, I think this these letters that Paul is writing, they're pretty apropos to what we are experiencing even in our day. You know, it says, the Bible says in the last time that there will be a great falling away of Christians, really, a falling away from the truth of Christianity. Well, uh, we're, I think we're seeing that happening in our day. 
And um, what's happening is that we're not rooted and grounded in the true foundation of Christ and Christ alone. And a lot of the religious spirit has moved in and actually doctrines of demons have come into our church circles and taught us the ways of the devil instead of the ways of God. And so um, we're seeing a great shakening in our churches today, which I think is really healthy for us because a shakening always shakes away what isn't God and brings, and brings clarity to what is God. And actually there are heresies that are growing, coming here and there all over the church, the churches today. And um, Paul in 1 Corinthians says, there must be heresies among you. That's a very startling statement. He means that things are known by their opposite. So if you know, if you can see a heresy, then you will see, you'll be able to really, the truth will be magnified greater, great, greater than, than the heresy. So who's true will, will be revealed through these heresies. So um, in this day and time, there are doctrines of demons that are coming to our church circles and teaching heresies, really. But, and Paul calls it, the, in Colossians, he is saying that what has beguiled, it's beguiled you. These vain, vain philosophers have come to beguile you. Well, what, what, what do you mean philosophers? Well, if we think about that part of the world, it wasn't far from a Athens. And we know that all the great philosophers were there in Athens and all the great teachers, which is really the wisdom of this world. It's not the wisdom of God. It's not the knowledge of God. It's the philosophers uh, teaching the wisdom of this world. You see, and so they they were probably prevalent in that area as well. These philosophies. So it was some vain philosophies that were coming. And Paul actually says in verse six, verse eight of chapter two. And we're going to go verse by verse, but I'm going to. This is just basically an introduction. But he says in verse eight of chapter two, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiment of the world and not after Christ. See, he's elevating Christ. In Christ alone we stand. He is the rock that we stand on. He also says in chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, let no man beguile you. So this is a beguilement, beguilement and, uh, and deceit. You know, in, Col in Galatians, it says that they were bewitched. So this is devilment that's really come in to the church circles, to these young believers, enticing them away with grand speculations. And I think we have that today. We, sometimes we're more um, uh, tantalized by speculation than we are really in the root in the rooting and grounding in what the Word of God says. We need to be rooted in what God says and not what we think or what not what my opinion is. Just recently, my granddaughter said, well, that's my opinion, Mimi. And I said, well, it's not my, it, my opinion doesn't count. And she says, that's your opinion. My opinion is this. And I said, I said, oh, and I'm not going to say her name. I said, oh, it doesn't matter about opinions. What it matters is what God says. I mean, opinions can be here and there and everywhere, but what does God say? See, we're drawn away today by this same thing. And see, um, and Paul's strong desire was that they be rooted and grounded in the foundational truths of Christ. And that's what um, this, this book is about. And that's what we're going to see, that he is preeminent above all. And it says, for Christ is preeminent and the head of, and of the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. And he's the head. Guess what? Body and head are joined together as one. When you know you're the body, you'll know, and you know he is head, he is preeminent. He's got the final word every time. The Proverbs says we can make our plans, but let God will have the final word. Let him have the final word in your life. Ask him. If you have things that you desire that are not coming to pass, well, uh, delight yourself in him and he'll give you the desires of your heart. But we want the desires of our heart without delighting ourselves in him. Delight yourself in him. Love him. Seek him. Uh, see that he is the one that lives inside you, and you'll, you'll know that. You'll have that abundant life. Okay, the false teachers were enticing the young believers 
with enticing speculation. Boy, do we have that today. Rationalization and vain philosophy being puffed up in their fleshly mind. I mean, do you meet, have you met people that are just so puffed up they think they know everything? I mean, you can't say anything that they think they don't, they know more. The Bible says, and that also says, it says, I'm read you right out of what Colossians says. It says, vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind. Now, Corinthians says that we have the mind of Christ. Now, you can be vainly puffed up in your own fleshly mind, and you're not going to know anything. Really, you know nothing. You're foolish, really. This, this is the way a fool talks and acts, you see. And, um, and it also says that they were inundated with legalistic r ritualism. And that's true. I mean, mixed in. I mean, it's such a mixture of paganism, a lot of things that they were doing in the past that had mixed in with the pureness of the gospel. Boy, Paul comes about against that in Galatians when he says, if anybody teaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. If you mix anything with the pure gospel of Christ and Christ alone and Christ crucified for your sins, Christ raised for your justification, Christ glorified for your glorification and the only hope of glory, then if that's if you're not trusting in that and that alone, then you've got a weak foundation, a foundation that can crumble. Actually, Jesus said it's a foundation built on sand instead of on the rock. And, um, and, and so Satan is always trying to shake people off the true foundation. He does not want the body of Christ to build up in, and, and be rooted in who they really are in Christ. Once you know that, then Satan has no power over you. Actually, it says in 1 John that little children who just know their sins are forgiven, they can be shaken. You see, a little child can be shaken. You can tell him anything and he'll believe it. You see, he doesn't, he's not wise. He hasn't grown up. He's not wise in the word of God. He's not, he doesn't know the difference between, um, uh, Hebrew says his senses has not been exercised to know the difference between good and evil. What's, what will bring you off into unbelief and what keeps you solidly on faith? He won't know the difference. That's a young child. It says, but the young man have overcome the evil one because the word of God is solidly strong in them, rooted and grounded because we're built in Christ, not just in knowing a lot of scriptures. It's not that we have searched the scriptures and in the scriptures alone we think we're built up. No, we have to be built up in Christ. See, everything tries to divert us off of the person of Christ. Even knowing the scriptures can divert you off. Being a good person can divert you off. Being a good church member, none of these things are wrong in themselves. But if we're doing that in, from our own flesh to memorize, the, I knew a man that tried to memorize the whole New Testament. He thought, now the Bible talk tells us to move on into perfection. Now all I need to do is memorize the whole New Testament. Tried to do it. He still, it didn't help him. You see, we're perfected because we've got the perfect one living in us. We live by his perfection and his completeness. Okay, so what Paul is doing is rooting them and grounding them in the person of Christ himself. And first of all, he will bring out after his prayer, and we're going to do this next time, we're going to go through this wonderful, wonderful prayer at the beginning of Colossians, which we should pray over all of our churches, over all of our families, over our children as well. And we're going to do that next time. But this is, this is kind of a a synopsis of what he says in Colossians. Christ is the head of all, ruler of all authority. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Why would we want anything less than that? If we've got the ruler of all heaven and earth living inside of us, the one seated at the right hand of the Father with all authority, with all the throne rights, why would we want anything else? Because Satan is always beguiling and seducing us off into some kind of doctrines that we can believe in or some kind of new thought that somebody comes up with. Come back to the simplicities in Christ. Okay, he's the Lord of all creation. Wow. He's the author of reconciliation. I mean, he's the one that reconciled us to God. That's what salvation is about, is that we were lost and dead in trespasses and sins, and through the blood of Christ and through the body of Christ, he has reconciled us back to the Father. Why would we want anything less?
He is the hope of glory for every believer. We, that's what we continually say on Christ, our, on uh, the liberating secret. He is the source of the believer's power and of the believer's new life in Christ. He is the source. Flesh is not the source. The one that lives in me, in the spirit, in spirit, his spirit joined to my spirit is the source of resurrection power and the power that can live within us and the wisdom of God that can live within us. Okay, he is the embodiment of full deity. He is the embodiment. In him dwelleth the fullness of the bottle of the of the Godhead bodily. And he is and we are complete in him. My goodness, why would we want anything else? We he is the sustainer of all things. He holds you together. He holds every molecule of your body together. He will hold uh, people, loved ones together. He will hold families together. He will hold, he's the one that will, could hold a country together. He can hold the world together. He does hold the world together. If we trust him, you see. Otherwise, I mean, I'm sorry, he's going to shake everything that can be shaken until there is nothing that cannot but him left. And he will do that. And that's why we in the United States are being shaken today. Because it's, it, it's, it's because we as Christians, if we are on target, our nation will be on target. If we are, if he is the head and preeminent of our life and our family, the nation will be there. You see, it's the church that ne that has wobbled and is not standing strong in the truths of the of the gospel and in the truth of Jesus Christ being preeminent above all. He is the head of the church. I'm not the head of my, myself. I'm not the head of my family. I'm not other, my family's Holy Spirit. I'm not your Holy Spirit. Jesus is. He is. He and the Holy Spirit are one, and they li they live. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit lives inside of us. It says the Trinity lives within. And He is the resurrection uh, God-man that, ha that is joined, uh, that has caused us to be raised and seated with Him in glory. And He is the all-sufficient one that lives within us. Therefore, I can say I am all-sufficient. Therefore, I can say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So why would we want anything less? Well, we wouldn't. Because our hope is only in the in the Jesus that lives within and the Jesus that's paid the price. So thank you for joining us and we're going to start right in the scriptures next time. Goodbye. You have been listening to The Liberating Secret with Sylvia Pierce. We want to send a special thank you to all our supporters who make this program possible. If you have been blessed by this program and would like to contact Sylvia, you can write her at P.O. Box 43268 Louisville, Kentucky 40253. That's Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky 40253. You can also find more of Sylvia's teachings on her website. The web address is www.theliberatingsecret.com. That's www.theliberatingsecret.com. And be sure to listen again right here Monday through Friday at the same time for The Liberating Secret with author and teacher Sylvia Pierce. So until next time, may God richly bless you.